Most people have heard about DNA testing for ancestry information. Very few people have ever heard that you can actually check your DNA for your health status. In this episode, I'm talking with Ellie Busby, who is an expert at DNA testing to match it up with what you consume. As a plant-based vegan eater, she is adamant about the fact that you can go deep, deep, deep into your health and understand why you have the health issues you have and how to turn that around. Stick around. This is a great conversation. Are you ready to live the life you deserve? Do you want to feel vibrantly healthy? and reach your optimal weight without dieting while being kind to animals and the planet, then you're you're in the right place at the right time. Welcome to Plant-Based Eating for Health with your host, certified plant-based nutritionist, Kathleen Gage. So Ellie, really curious about how you work with your clients through Vojo on um, really helping them to get fit. Because right now, as we know, the world is getting more unhealthy by the day. That is definitely true. So the way Vojo works is we, we actually look at your genes to take a personalized approach to your health and fitness through personalized plant-based nutrition. And basically the problem is, is that, you know, a lot of people, a lot of clients and customers come to Vojo because they have so much conflicting information. You know, one, they're reading this in one place and that in the other place. Should you supplement omega-3s? Some people say yes. Other people say seeds are great. And, um, you know, it gets really confusing. And the answer is actually everybody is right. And it just depends on you and your body. And knowing your genes is kind of like a first step about learning about your body and what works for your body. Right, right. Well, I'm, I'm curious because a big issue for people nowadays is inflammation. And I actually have quite a few people I know that are dealing with inflammation. I uh, was just corresponding with a friend who has long haulers from COVID and it really bad with inflammation. Um, she's a meat eater. Uh, how would a diet of plant-based foods help people that have inflammation? Is that kind of a universal thing or it really depends on the person which plant-based foods they would consume? Well, I mean, when we say plant-based, we have to say really a more whole food plant-based now, don't we? Because (laughs) veganism, like, you know, 20 years ago or whatever it was, you had to be healthy. And now, as we all know, that's not the case. Uh, But yeah, you're totally right. By eating a more whole food plant-based diet, you are naturally getting more of those phytonutrients and antioxidants that you need to improve and reduce inflammation, which is especially important if you're working on your fitness, you're an athlete and you want to, um, you want to do more of it basically. And, you know, some people are more prone to inflammation. So it's, as, as I've started off saying, we're not all the same. And some people have genes, which means that they're just more prone to higher levels of inflammation after exercise or um, with with a, a worse diet as well. So it's I find it's always important to remember that we're just all different. And yeah, so a plant based diet can really help some people more than others. But in general, it's going to help your inflammation levels. Well, for somebody who uh, really wants to get fit and, and they're really not sure where to start, what, what would you advise them? Like if somebody comes to you and they want to work with you and they, they want to apply the Vojo mes- method, um, what's the procedure that you put people through? put people through. Sounds like a boot camp of some what kind. Are you, well, you know, <laughs> for some, they're going to feel like it's a boot camp. It's like, oh, I have to give that a cake up. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the first thing really is to have the DNA test. And that's just a simple saliva swab. Um, and from that, we get a lot of information about your body, but you know, that's really just the starting point because your genes are definitely not everything but it's a really good place to start figuring out what works for you. So once you have your genes, then you can know, you know, if you just start from scratch, it's just kind of overwhelming. There is so much data and information out there. If you have your genes, you're narrowing it down a bit. You're like, okay, I know some of the things that I can test out and try. And then we, we do some coaching. So we have a call and we, um, we focus on, on a main goal. And then we talk about the barriers and the issues and how that relates to your genes. And then we come up with some simple solutions to try 
they bringing all of that together and you know then it's just an experiment really and we come back and we see what worked what didn't uh reevaluate it's you know figuring out what works for you is a constant experiment but the right. more you do it the, now, uh, do you work primarily with high performers or do you work with just about anybody who really wants to get into high performance shape it's really anybody so uh-huh. Um, most people that come to Vojo actually are, are not high performers. They, you know, they're, they're, they're runners or they, they just want to start running or they, they want to improve their fitness and, um, potentially lose a bit of weight, um, and generally just live a longer, healthy life and know how to do that. Well, let me ask you this. First of all, how did you get involved in this line of work? Because it, it, actually, you're the first person I've talked to that really addresses the whole DNA issue of, of helping people to get fit um, and eat healthy. So how did you get involved with the DNA testing and just health in general? So it came about from my own issues. I've been vegan for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And you know, everything was going great. Like for the first few years, I was that really annoying person that would tell everybody to go vegan because it's so easy and there's really no excuse. Um, and then about four or five years in, I started having health issues. I'm a runner. So, uh, I started getting really bad joint pain and inflammation, which is crazy. We just spoke about inflammation that how a plant-based diet is good, but you know, I've been plant-based like whole food plant-based for a while. And um, my hair started falling out and I was like, what, all of these things are happening to me? Are you like, are you insane? Um, Cause I just, I just thought they were, those happened to people that didn't eat well. You know, you just mm-hmm. expect that people who have problems on a plant-based diet just aren't getting the nutrients they need. They're not doing the right, the right things. And it's, and I, around that time, I just happened to have a DNA test anyway. And I just discovered all of these things about myself. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. Um, and I, I personalized my diet to my genes and, um, it just, it just solved so many things for me. And, you know, you you just, you, you, you can't help, but compare yourself to other people. And when you're struggling and other people aren't, and they're potentially eating similar things to you, you start to wonder what's wrong with you, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's nothing that's wrong with you. It's just, maybe you have some genes which were useful to the human race at some point, And now they're not so useful, but you can work with them. And then on the other hand, you have genes that are very useful and um, they're beneficial to you. So Interesting. there are actually genes that are good for a plant-based diet and genes that can hinder a plant-based diet as well. Well, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Before we do, I want to remind people you're listening to the Plant-Based Eating for Health podcast show. This is Kathleen Cage, and I am talking with Ellie Busby, and she is with Vojo. And uh, Vojo helps people to get to their optimum health through DNA testing and obviously more uh, fine-tuning on what they should and should not eat. Now, I'm curious, with um, the DNA testing, what can you tell about how a person should eat, what comes up in the testing. That's fascinating to me. Uh, We look at quite a few different areas. So um, we do look at your nutrient needs. And so let's take an example. Let's take omega-3 as an example, because that's that's one that there's a lot of controversy about. Um, Basically, there is a gene which determines how well you can convert plant-based omega-3s, ALA, into DHA, the type of fish that's found in fish and and other animal foods. Some people are really good at making this conversion and some people aren't so good at making this conversion. So when we look at that, we kind of decide, okay, do you really need to be supplementing high dose alkyl oil every day? Or is that kind of a waste of money for you? So that's just one example. I mean, there are other genes that feed into this. For example, the Alzheimer's gene. If you have the Alzheimer's gene, which significantly increases your risk of Alzheimer's, you should really be supplementing a high dose omega-3 earlier on in life. So there are a few genes that go into each nutrient, but yeah, that's a, that's one example. That's fascinating. I actually just wrote an article. Are you at risk for Alzheimer's? And I I brought in two brain experts and they're both vegan plant-based and, you know, they both had a different perspective. Um, You know, end result is the same thing to minimize the risk. Um, and, and it's fascinating that that could be that you could have the gene for that. Um, now, 
what's one of your, what you would consider your greatest success stories with somebody who has come to you and they really needed help? You did the DNA testing, you did all the protocols, you put them on a certain eating uh, regime. And, you know, we'll say it is like a boot camp because, you know, some people they're so attached to the the bad foods they're eating, even though it makes them super unhealthy, that they feel like they're, you know, going through boot camp. So what's one of your greater success stories? So I had one lady come to me who had always struggled with her weight all her life, always Uh struggled with, um, knowing what to eat or how to eat. And even when she ate what she thought was healthy, she would have problems like weight issues and her weight would be up and down. Um, And she also couldn't exercise so much because she'd had a few injuries. So this was really a problem for her. Um, And going through her DNA results was such a revelation because we could see why she'd always struggled there are a number of genes associated with uh, your appetite levels and your hunger hormones, your, uh, your tendency to store fat, your tendency to burn fat. And, you know, as I just said before, you, you compare yourself to other people and so many people come to me and they're like, but my husband eats this and my partner eats the same as me. And they're like, you know, they look great. Why don't I? And it's like, we have to realize that, we're not all the same. Like we just Mm -hmm. have to have this, this paradigm shift. And I think it's starting, but um, this was, this was a a really beautiful (laughs) moment. I think I would describe it as. And, and what was the result of, of her following the protocol that you gave her? So she'd always struggled previously to, to follow advice because she did it for a few weeks and nothing seemed to work well, or it did. And then she wouldn't be able to keep it up. But because this advice was tailored to her and she knew this is what she needed, she was able to stick to it. And she was able to actually create healthier habits that worked for her and not worry about losing weight quickly or like doing this unsustainably. She started doing it sustainably. She was, um, she also transitioned to a more plant-based diet because of this as well. So not only did she transition to plant-based, she also put in these healthy habits and started losing weight slowly and she felt good about herself. So I'm curious, you, you talked about quick weight loss and, and people are very addicted to quick weight loss. You know, I, I've been in that camp for many years. And when I went plant-based, actually, that's when my weight really stabilized, but I've been as high as 60 pounds heavier than I am right now. And, uh, 50 pounds less, you know, by starving myself basically. And just, you know, like the, the typical roller coaster that people have. And I'm curious with the whole mindset of quick weight loss and what food manufacturers have actually done to our food to get us addicted. How does that all play together with the DNA? Has DNA shifted as a result of the really the uh, scientific measurements that food manufacturers have put into food to get us addicted, to get that bliss factor going on. Um, I've read a lot about it. Salt, sugar, fat is a great book on that topic. What's your take on that as far as the addictions people get to foods and then the whole quick weight loss and how do they get out of that mindset? You're so right. I think the book is the Dorito effect, right? Well, there's the Dorito effect, there's salt, sugar, fat, Mm -hmm. there's hooked, there's several books that really talk about that. They're all fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I I totally agree. And, but we all react to addictions differently. So more, some people become more addicted um, than others or have a greater tendency to be addicted to others. And there are several different mechanisms in genetics around this. Um, One of them being, um, the ability to taste sweetness. So some people can actually taste sweetness more than others. Some people don't taste fat as well as other people, which actually leads to higher fat consumption accidentally. Um, And then there's all of these genes in our dopamine levels and our dopamine response. And these have been associated with um, how easily we become addicted to things like sugar. Mm -hmm. So knowing that as well, and knowing that you you potentially have these addictive tendencies that also helps people, you know, just having, even if your experience is actually the same, 
having this insight into the mechanisms of your body and your brain and what's going on really helps people to work on it. And, you know, we have studies on this that show that people are much more likely to take personal advice, advice that's personal to them, their situation and their genes. So even if you have an addiction, a food addiction, you can overcome it by understanding how your body works. You know, that's so true because I've actually been sober for 38 years. I, I have a real addiction to alcohol and to drugs and anything that alters my state. And one person could have a glass of wine, they'd be fine. Somebody like me, I have a glass of wine and it's like, well, that's not enough. I need, you know, one's too many and one's not enough really. Um, and, and so I, I can put it into that context. And in 12 step programs, that's the very first thing they, they have you do is admit that you are powerless. You can't do this thing. You need help from somebody else. You need to really admit you have a problem. And I'm, I'm curious with, you know, as our world becomes more and more obese, um, what would be some simple first steps that people can take in order to start shifting that besides reaching out to you, which by the way, how do people reach you? So our website is vojo.health and all of the information is on there, but on every, um, uh, on every social media platform, we're predominantly on Instagram. It's at Vojo Health. Okay. So at Vojo Health is on Instagram and most of the socials and Vojo.com is the website. Vojo.health. Vojo.health. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. We'll make sure to put that in the show notes. So what are some first steps that people can take? Because I know that a lot of people feel so powerless and they feel so out of control. And with COVID and all the lockdowns, you know, people have gained the COVID. First, it was the COVID-10, then it was the COVID-15. Now we're moving into the COVID-50. Um, I mean, some people have gained massive amounts of weight because they're sitting in front of the TV. They're, you know, that isolation is literally killing them. So give us some solutions. So the first thing that I would do is, well, there's a couple of things. The first thing I would do is start exercising. If you're not exercising already, it's it's just so powerful for stress relief, for obviously keeping yourself in shape, but also for improving your immune system. We've seen studies that show that actually exercising helps you recover from COVID. At the beginning, we were told not to exercise because it might harm us, but actually it's been shown to boost recovery. Um, so you know, exercise is just an all round great thing to be doing. And couch to 5k, which we have in the UK, uh, is an amazing way to get people running 5k in six weeks. And so many people have been doing it. It's been great. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. It, well, you know, I got to tell you, just, just this morning, before, my morning routine is I meditate, do yoga, I do some journaling, I read something inspirational, then I go out for a run. And I don't care what the temperature is, unless it's dangerously cold. But it was like 38 degrees today, which is nippy, but it felt so good. And it's like, the more <laughs> I do it, the more I feel like doing it. And, and that's kind of a catch 22 for people. They say, well, I just don't feel like it. And sometimes we have to do what we don't feel like doing to get to the end result that we're looking for. So I, I rudely interrupted you, but please continue. What are some other things? No, I agree with you. Sometimes it feels like something is going to be effort, but there can be that positive feedback loop where when you start doing it, you feel good. And then you actually want to do more of it because you feel good. And then, you know, it's like it continues and you're like, oh, wow, this isn't actually that hard. Um, but you're right. You have to overcome that first hurdle to, to start. And the other thing is, start listening to your body. So there is so much diet and nutrition advice out there, but I want you to start listening to yourself, see how you feel, eat mindfully, be aware of what you're doing. Awareness is so key and be like, be aware of what you're eating, be aware of how your body feels at every moment, evaluate. And just having that awareness, you can realize maybe that you're just, you, you're actually eating too much. You actually feel like you're you're eating to, until you're too full, but you haven't even realized because you're not even listening to your body. Until your stomach is bloated out. That's what I used to do is like, I would eat until I was so uncomfortable and then I felt bad about it. So I would eat some more. I mean, literally like a box of donuts. I didn't eat one. I ate the whole box. And if anybody dared to take one of my donuts, I'd go out and get another <laughs> box. I mean, crazy stuff. And you're listening to the Plant-Based Eating for Health podcast show. Be sure to subscribe to this channel wherever you're listening and leave a rating and review. Now, back to the show. 
So Ellie, you know, I'm curious about uh, the whole topic of mindful eating, because you you really are about mindful eating and making people more aware of what they're consuming and energy and all of that. What can you advise to people or what are your insights around how people can be much more mindful about what they put in their body? So I really liked what you said before when you said, you know, you, you kind of meditate on how, where your food has come from. Uh, before you eat it. And that's just a really nice way to, to ground yourself before you start eating and to, to give yourself, and it also gives you time to get ready to eat because I mean, there's a physiological aspect here as well as a mental aspect, your body needs to get ready to digest. Um, So that's a really good process to do before you start eating. But then when you're eating, try and actually taste the food, like with every mouthful taste, how does it feel in your mouth? How does it taste? And just take your time. This can be quite difficult to do if you're eating with lots of people and it's a social event. But, you know, if you're alone or even if you're with one other person, just try mindful eating and see and see how you feel. You know, a lot of people seem to struggle with digestive issues when they first go to a plant based diet. And it's true, like a plant based diet definitely has more fiber and stuff. But, you know, I think part of it is our, our way of eating. We eat so quickly, we eat distracted. We're like, we end up eating too much because we're distracted and we don't actually feel our bodies. Um, our, our digestive system isn't ready to cope with the foods. So, you know, when you transition, you do have to make, you have to take it slowly as well. So your gut bacteria can adjust, but this is something you could take forward in general. You bring up a great point because I know that we've become a fast food society worldwide. It's not just in the UK. It's not in the US. It's not just Australia. It's all over the world that people are uh, a push button society. And one of the things that has really helped me to be much more mindful of how I'm eating is I actually sit at the table. I set the table. I put candles on and it's turn off any distraction. I put soft meditative music and some people go, oh, there you go with that woo woo stuff. And yet nine times out of 10, I'd say 10 times out of 10, the people that I expose to that, they're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And a a few years ago, actually, we had some uh, young people staying with us. They were in their late teens, early twenties. And we actually would sit down for meals at every meal. They were with us for about a week. And the first time we did that, they said, we've never eaten dinner at the table. And I'm like, really? They didn't even know I had cloth napkins and with, you know, nice napkin holders and really set, you know, set the environment. And they were like, this is so nice. And they had never been exposed to that. And I thought, isn't that a pity? But um, when we pray over our food, it helps us to be more mindful. And, you know, it's interesting, and I'd love to get your take on this, is um, with the energy of animal-based foods that people put into their body, um, my belief is that they are definitely taking on the energy of what that animal went through all its life up to its death, the whole processing of putting it through the the supply chain and then on their plate. And many people don't look at that. What is your take on the whole process of energetically, we take on the foods that we put in our body? Um, In terms of the nutrients, I definitely agree there. And in terms of your um, empathetic ability or how, um, how much empathy or how much connection you have with what you're eating, I for sure agree when I, when I went first went vegan, it was, it was not a possibility for me. You know, I actually went vegan in a Buddhist monastery because I, I'd been meditating for so much and I had this, um, kind of awakening, uh, where I realized that it was just not the right thing to do to eat animals. I mean, I've been a meat eater for my whole life. I loved meat. Um, and I just had this realization that I just could not eat meat anymore. It just felt awful. And it felt so right to eat um, plant foods. Mm -hmm. And so I see what you mean there because there is this kind of energetic feeling to doing something you feel is right and living in a way that you feel, um, is an ethical and moral way to live. Well, and, and it's amazing how many people I've talked to that have that same mindset of what you just explained that one day they just realized this is not this is not who I am. This is not what I want to do. And um, I was on a Facebook group recently where there was a picture of all these different types of animals. And it, it was saying, I am not bacon. I am not steak. I am not. And it was cute little animals. And, you know, so you would think that people would kind of get that. 
I could not believe the ridicule that people in the group were making towards vegans. And what I did rather than attacking, I just went in with facts and figures about, you know, factory farming around our health and all that. And I don't know if it impacted anybody, but I think that people have gotten to a point that they're very unconscious about what they're consuming, which actually impacts their health. So Ellie, in closing, uh, first of all, give your web address again, so people can definitely reach out to you. Vojo.health. Vojo.health. We'll make sure to put that in the show notes. And I really want to thank you for your time and for sharing your insights and your wisdom. And in closing, what are your final thoughts for people? What would you like to leave them with? Um, I guess just listen to your body because when you start listening, you can kind of figure out what is right for you. And just remember that everybody is different. And just because something works for someone else doesn't mean it's going to work for you. So take every bit of advice, even my advice with a pinch of salt, go and see what works for you and research it yourself. And um, yeah, live in a way that works for you and your body. I I love that to, you know, get as much information as possible, make your own decision based on really tuning into what's needed for you. And again, you've been listening to the plant-based eating for health podcast show. I'm your host, Kathleen Gage, and I encourage you to go out, be conscious of what you're doing, live a compassionate life and live a healthy life. Have a great day, a great evening, a great middle of the night, whenever you may be listening to this. Thank you for your commitment to an ethical life through plant-based food choices the kind of choices that are kind to your body, the environment, and most of all, animals. Be sure to leave a review and rating of the Plant-Based Eating for Health podcast show.